First passage is from Numbers chapter 21, verse 1 to 20, and it can be found on page 134 of the Church Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there should be some Bibles under the seat in front of you. Okay, starting from verse 1. When the Canaanite king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming on the Aphram road, he fought against Israel and captured some prisoners. Then Israel made a vow to the Lord, If you will hand this people over to us, we will completely destroy their cities. The Lord listened to Israel's request and handed the Canaanites over to them. And Israel completely destroyed them and their cities. So they named the place Hormah. Then they set out from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to bypass the land of Edom. But the people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you led us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread or water and we detest this wretched food. Then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and they bit them so that many Israelites died. The people then came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Intercede with the Lord so that he will take the snakes away from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake image and mount it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will recover. So Moses made a bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. Whenever someone was bitten and he looked at the bronze snake, he recovered. The Israelites set out and camped at Oboth. They set out from Oboth and camped at Iye Abarim in the wilderness that borders Moab on the east. From there, they went and camped at Zered Valley. They set out from there and camped on the other side of the Arnon River in the wilderness that extends from the Amorite border because the Arnon was the Moabite border between Moab and the Amorites. Therefore, it is stated in the book of the Lord's Wars, Waheb in Sufa, and the ravines of the Arnon, even the slopes of the ravines that extend to the site of Ar and lie along the border of Moab. From there, they went to Beer, the well the Lord Moses, uh, the well the Lord told Moses about. Gather the people, so I may give them water. Then Israel sang this song: "Spring up, well, sing to it." The princes dug the well, the nobles of the people hollowed it out with a scepter and with their staves. They went from the wilderness to Matna, from Matna to Nahaliel, from Nahaliel to Bamoth, from Bamoth to the valley in the territory of Moab, near the Pisgah highlands that overlook the wasteland. Verse 21, Israel sent messengers to say to King Sihon of the Amorites, let us travel through your land. We won't go into the fields or vineyards. We won't drink any well water. We will travel the king's highway until we have traveled through your territory. But Sihon would not let Israel travel through his territory. Instead, he gathered his whole army and went out to confront Israel in the wilderness. When he came to Jahaz, he fought against Israel. Israel struck him with the sword and took possession of his land from the Arnon to the Jabbok, but only up to the Ammonite border because it was fortified. Israel took all the cities and lived in all these Amorite cities, including Heshbon and all its surrounding villages. Heshbon was the city of King Sihon of the Amorites who had fought against the, the former king of Moab and had taken tr- control 
of all his land as far as the Arnon. Therefore, the poets say, come to Heshbon, let it be rebuilt. Let the city of Sihon be restored, for fire came out of Heshbon, a flame from the city of Sihon. It consumed Ar of Moab, the citizens of Arnon's heights. Woe to you, Moab! You have been destroyed, people of Chemosh. He gave up his sons as refugees and his daughters into captivity to Sihon, the Amorite king. We threw them down. Heshbon has been destroyed as far as Dibon. We caused desolation as far as Nopha, which reaches as far as Medaba. So Israel lived in the Amorites' land. After Moses sent spies to Jazer, Israel captured its surrounding villages and drove out the Amorites who were there. Then they turned and went up the road to Bashan, and King Og of Bashan came out against them with his whole army to do battle at Edrei. But the Lord said to Moses, Do not fear him, for I have handed him over to you along with his whole army and his land. Do to him as you did to King Sihon of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon. So they struck him, his sons, and his whole army until no one was left, and they took possession of his land. Uh, well read. Uh, do keep your Bibles open. Uh, this will help you to follow the passage today. Um, and as we go along, we'll also come across some slides that uh, I'll ask the AV team to pop up when we get to those. Um, I'm Dave, if you haven't met me. Um, love to chat with you afterwards if, if you're new and I haven't yet chatted with you. Do, do come up and chat with me. Let me pray to begin. Father, we are here as your people, ready to hear your word, to hear that which we need. By your spirit, work deep in us the truths we hear, that we will be nourished, equipped, and built up in the faith. Your people responding in faith and made ever Christ-like for your glory. Amen. Well, the young man was disillusioned. He's probably also suffering from depression, but like most men, he didn't want to know that. He worked hard, but he was stuck in his stressful job that was not living up to expectations. His young kids were proving to be so hard, so much harder than expected. Pumped up from leaving uni for work, he had been excited about church. He met a lovely woman there and His marriage for the first number of years was great, but now things seem tense. He swore he would never have his parents' marriage. He would be the next generation who would do things differently. But if he had to admit it, it was just like theirs. Though he had tried to fix things and do all the things he knew he should do as a Christian, he kept falling back into sin and was was defeated and deflated. Life wasn't meant to be like this, was it? Friends, where do we look to when we don't feel like life is going right? Our Christian walk is so up and down and up and down and we feel so defeated by sin. We saw in Numbers last week that God's people had had just come from a devastating failure of their leadership. Their leaders had failed to trust God and received God's painful judgment that these leaders would not be allowed to, to, to see the promised land. Their high priest Aaron was now dead and now the next generation of Israelites is in focus. How would this next generation of Israelites fare in the challenges and hardships of their lives? 
in their struggle, what would God teach them about himself and how they were to respond to him? Friends, today we are going to see in the passage the good news that Israel were to see, that God is faithful and we are to look to him in everything. God is faithful and we are to look to him in everything. Now the four points of our passage today, God is faithful, look to him in prayer. Number two, God is faithful, look to him when you sin. Number three, God is faithful, look to him in the wilderness. And number four, God is faithful, look to him to defeat the enemy. So point number one, God is faithful, look to him in prayer. God is faithful, look to him in prayer. Would you turn with me to Numbers 21 and I'll read for us from there. When the Canaanite king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming on the Atherim road, he fought against Israel and captured some prisoners. Hang on. Let's pause here. Our ears should be pricking up, shouldn't they? Israel, coming along a mountain road, is attacked by a king from the southern area of Canaan. If I could have the next slide up. Friends, you can see the area on the map that I have circled. This is the the, the southern area of the promised land. Thanks, you can take that down now. This is Canaan. This is the land God promised to the Israelites way back in Genesis. But in Numbers 14, the the, the previous generation of Israelites was banished from entering there after their, their, their failure to trust God and their rebellion against him. Trying to get around their banishment, the previous generation had tried to enter the promised land on their own, in their own strength, and had been bitterly smashed by the Canaanites. Will that happen again? Well, verse 2. Then Israel made a vow to the Lord. If you will hand this people over to us, we will completely destroy their cities. The Lord listened to Israel's request and handed the Canaanites over to them And Israel completely destroyed them in their cities. So they named the place Hormah. Well, unlike the previous generation, this generation looked to Yahweh. They look to God in prayer, verse 2, in the form of a vow. Verse 3 calls it a request. A request of Yahweh that he be faithful in upholding his side of their request. And that is verse 2, if you, God, we will. God, if you hand the people over, over to us, we will dedicate them to you in destruction. That's what the word means. To many modern ears, that, that, that sounds gross, doesn't it? How can this be justified? Aren't they calling for genocide? Why would God listen to their request? If I could have the next slide, please. Genesis 15, 16 says this. In the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity, that is the wickedness, of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. This is God's promise to Abram that his descendants would one day come into this promised land. We learn elsewhere in the Bible and in other ancient sources that the people in Canaan were practicing child sacrifice and practicing the the, the most perverted sexual deviations with, with each other and with animals. It's so graphic that actually I can't share it with you right here. It's way too graphic. But needless to say, even in 2024 in the West, we would still gasp at what they were doing. Now, this is not genocide. Like the flood was in Noah's time, 
It was God's will that Israel be agents of his divine judgment on the Amorites in Canaan and in the surrounding areas. God waited 400 years as their wickedness grew and grew and grew till it reached full measure. So as Israel looked to God in prayer, what are they asking to be done? They're asking for God's will to be done. That they would be successful to do his will and bring his judgment on the wicked people of Canaan. And we read that God is faithful as they look to him in prayer. God delivers the Canaanites over to his people and they destroy them and name the place Horma, which means destruction. Memorable, huh? The Israelites knew of God's will for them to bring judgment. They, they, they knew their marching orders. They knew what they were called to do, to be obedient and to give him glory. The question for us is this. Do we know our marching orders, what we should be praying for? Friends, we don't know what the next six months will bring in each of our lives. But we do know what God commands of us, what honours him. His command of our lives and our growth in holiness commands to, to go and make disciples of every nation. Father, align our hearts and our minds to do your will. May your kingdom come. Would you fulfill in and through us your great commission? Friends, as we navigate the ups and downs of our life together as God's people, our gathering together and our looking to God in prayer will be a sign of our trust in God's faithfulness. Church, God is faithful. Look to him in prayer. Well, this wouldn't be the time when Israel would begin to settle in the promised land. This was just a kind of a cross-border army mission. But what a great sign this was of this new generation of Israelites looking to God. It's like they've come back from a Christian Union camp, right? That that they've heard talks from a certain Tim Grant and they're on fire for God. But it wasn't to last. You see, life was hard when they got back. Point number two, God is faithful. Look to him when you sin. God is faithful. Look to him when you sin. Verse four, then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to bypass the land of Edom. But the people became impatient Because of the journey. The people have to go around Edom. As we learnt about in in, in chapter 20. And they they become so impatient. Why? And the people complain. They complain against God and his chosen leader Moses in verse 5. Why have you led us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread or water, and we detest this wretched food. God, it was better in Egypt. You're trying to kill us. And this sweet manna, this quail meat, and the water that you provide, ah. Some of you who have little kids would know that sometimes they rebelliously throw food back in your face that they don't want, right? The wickedness of discontent, ingratitude and rebellion. Discontent isn't really just, it's just really an expression of pride. I deserve better than what God has given me. 
And that leads to coveting from others, doesn't it? God, why have you blessed them but not me? 17th century pastor Thomas Boston preached a sermon called The Hellish Sin of Discontent. And he points out that, that discontent accuses God of injustice, of folly and of cruelty. The little book of Jude in the New Testament makes it clear that people are in hell because of discontent. And it's the kind of sin that, ca- that characterizes hell. That, that the place of never-ending discontent. The place of the, the gnashing of teeth. Friends, don't let's find ourselves cultivating the sin of discontent. It is wicked. And those who continue practicing it are hell-bound. You see, friends, at its core, this is also the sin of the Garden of Eden. God, you're not good. You're holding back something from me. I don't trust you. You're evil. Friends, such sin deserves death. And we've all done it. So what does God do about his people's rebellion? Verse 6. Then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people and they bit them so that many Israelites died. God sends poisonous, or in the original Hebrew, fiery snakes in judgment on them and many of them die. Friends, what's your reaction to hearing that? Our culture today has no sense of a reverent fear of a holy God. No understanding that he is passionately angry at sinners and will judge the world in righteousness. So when we read of God swiftly bringing his judgment, we're a bit shocked. Couldn't you have just given them another warning? A theologian put it this way to make a point. Nobody's amazed by grace. We are amazed by wrath. In other words, we are amazed when God reminds his people that he is God and you shall not presume upon his patience. God will bring judgment on sinners at any time. Every person is one cancer diagnosis, one heartbeat away from meeting their judge. Well, as the poison begins to be absorbed by their lymphatic system, the people recognize in their fiery agony that they have sinned against God and Moses, verse 7. And they ask Moses to intercede with God for them. And Yahweh's response, verse 4 to 8 to 9, rather, then the Lord said to Moses, make a snake image and mount it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will recover. So Moses made a bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. Whenever someone was bitten and he looked at the bronze snake, he recovered. Look at a bronze snake mounted on a pole. Not a passing glance, but fix your eyes on it. Can you imagine the, 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 the chaos, the snakes and the people writhing around everywhere? The, 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 the screaming and then the, the sobbing terror. What do you mean, look at that? Can't you see what my problem is? Looking doesn't stop them from being bitten. Did you see that? But whoever looks at it, whoever lays down their disbelief and trusts God was healed. What a strange picture this is. Biblical scholars have struggled with this. Why does God choose to send snakes? And and, and why, of all things, is his solution to be a bronze image of a snake on a pole? Why not a a needle of anti-venom? Or a gigantic box of bandages? 
Well, there's been all kinds of ideas. Is it that the snakes were a symbol of Egypt? You know, the, the, the cobra on Pharaoh's headdress, for example. Is God reminding them of, of their impressors, uh, impressors back in Egypt? Is it the bite of sin showing how uh, poisonous sin is? No, I don't think so. You see, these don't really fit that well with the passage. God is not reminding them of the tyranny of Egypt. And God is not saving his people ultimately here from sin. No, the snakes are God's judgment that he brings on his people. You see, the snakes are to be a reminder ultimately of the curse all the way back in Genesis 3. Can I have the next slide up, please? I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Thanks. You put that down. Israel are experiencing a, a vivid picture of God's judgments that fallen humanity would experience the snake that strikes their heel. Israel, you are experiencing God's curse, his judgment. You see, Israel ultimately, doesn't, uh, ultimately needs saving from God himself, from his curse, his judgment on sinners. Israel's issue, and your and my issue, it is not with sin itself, it's with God. It's with God. But Israel, look, God is faithful to that covenant promise he made to Abram. He has made a way to deal with his judgment and you to live. Look at this symbol of the, your curse mounted on a pole. Look and live. Look to him in your sin. Friends, the same God is still God of this universe. And all of us have, experienced, uh, have expressed ingratitude towards God. All of us have rebelled against him. Where is my serpent? Why has he not struck down me with a serpent? Judgment is coming though. How will any of us live? Jesus says these words to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Could we have the slide up? Just as Moses lifted up in the, the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God, so loved, uh, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus is saying he would be the snake lifted up. Jesus would himself become the curse for us. Lifted up and mounted on a pole. Can we have the next slide? The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. Jesus would experience the wrath and judgment of God on behalf of sinners. He would be lifted up, not just for salvation for Israel, but for everyone who believes, or literally, that all the believing ones may have eternal life. Can we have the next slide? Christ became this a, a curse for us because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Thanks, you put that down. Friends, have you looked to him? The one lifted up? Have you believed? The judgment, the curse of God taken for us, eternal life for all who look to him. And friends, this isn't just one look 
at the quick glance. Keep looking at him. Keep believing in him. Christian, when you are feeling defeated by your sin, God is faithful. Look to him when you sin. Well, after Israel's sin, their hardships didn't just become better. But they learn who God is in the midst of their circumstances. Point number three. God is faithful. Look to him in the wilderness. God is faithful. Look to him in the wilderness. Follow with me from Numbers chapter 21. Uh, sorry, 21 verses 10 rather. The Israelites set out and camped to Oboth. They set out from Oboth and camped to Iliad Arium in the wilderness that borders Moab on the east. And from there they went and camped at Zered Valley. They set out from there and camped on the other side of the Arnon River in the wilderness that extends from the Amorite border because Arnon was the Moabite border between Moab and the Amorites. Israel, after taking the, the, the long way around Edom and now making their way north, Quite some way now, now west of the pro, uh, sorry, east rather of the promised land, on the other side of the Jordan River. If numbers is a road trip book, as Tim uh, said it was, and I think we should agree, this part is the travel blog. The Israelites set out and camped, set out and camped, set out and camped. The translators of the, ES, uh, the CSB, rather, it, they even try and vary it up in verse 12. From there, they went and camped. Woo! Got a break from the camp, from their setting out. The places they camped aren't of great renown. M- most of them today, we only know of the general area. These are no-name places. Monterna, Burwood, not quite. And verse 14, this was recorded in a book of the Lord's wars. Huh. We don't have that book. That they even camped safely among the slopes and in the ravines. Now, I used to like camping when I was younger, you know, by a lovely river in a beautiful forest with toilets and showers. But these are not pretty little campsites. These are rough. Nowhere places in the wilderness. But friends, in the rough, nowhere places, Israel experienced God's faithfulness. Verse 16, he was faithful to his promise and gave them water. They called the place not beer, but be'er, meaning well. Creative name, right? And God's faithfulness brings gladness to their hearts. Their song is recorded for us in in verse 18. No longer is it Moses speaking to a rock to call forth water. Israel are, in a manner, singing to this well provided by God. Your God, your God's faithful provision to us yet, well, so spring up well. And they sing even of the nobles working to dig this together. In the wilderness, Israel's hearts were uplifted as they looked to their faithful God. Well, my dear Christian brothers and sisters, do you feel that you are in a way in the wilderness now? Your life seems to be a hard routine of the same thing, with little change. You're not where you would love to be. Perhaps you're frustrated, tempted to sin. Is God doing anything in my wilderness? Friends, we have this recorded for us to show that God is faithful in the wilderness. He will provide for your needs. He will provide joy and hope. And there is joy along the way. And there's digging work, things to do, knowing that he is faithful. And church, let's grow in our joy and our desire to sing together. Let's help 
remind each other to remember God's faithfulness. Friends, God is faithful. Look to him in the wilderness. And finally, not only was there wilderness, but there was the enemy. Point number four, God is faithful. Look to him to defeat the enemy. God is faithful. Look to him to defeat the enemy. I'll read from verse 21. Israel sent messengers to say to King Sihon of the Amorites, let us travel through your lands. We won't go into the fields or vineyards. We won't drink any well water. We will travel to the, uh, the king's highway until we have traveled through your territory. But Sihon would not let Israel travel through his territory. Instead, he gathered his whole army and went out to confront Israel in the wilderness. When he came to Jahaz, he fought against Israel. Israel struck him with the sword and took possession of his land from the Arnon to the Jabbok, but only up to the Amorite border, Ammonite border, rather, because it was fortified. Like they did towards Edom, Israel sends messengers to King Sihon of the Amorites, asking for, for a peaceful passage. But King Sihon instead attacks Israel, but he's smashed. Israel put him to the sword and, and took his territory. This is the Lord's wars, remember? And God gives the Amorite cities to Israel. They again completely destroy the people, the cities and the villages that they capture. But this time, some of Israel settle into the land as their army continues north, uh, onwards. Rather, th th This win against King Sihon was, was quite an achievement. The poem of verse 27 to 30 mocks the weakness of Moab and their so-called god Shemush. You see, King Sihon had destroyed the cities of Moab. Big, bad King Sihon. But then Israel had utterly smashed King Sihon. Israel and their God are the unstoppable force, destroying or driving out the Amorites. And then scary King Og of Bashan, Another Amorite king further north again. I'll get you to pop up the next slide, please. So up, right up the top of the map, they're circled. Thanks. Take that down. <coughs> and of King Og, verse 34. But the Lord said to Moses, Do not fear him, for I have handed him over to you along with his whole army and his land. Do to, to him as you did to King Sihon of the Amorites who lived in Heshbon. Israel generation one would have run away in fear. But Israel generation two know the promise of their faithful God. Looking to him in faith, they do battle with King Og. They destroy him and they take his land. Time and time and time again, God is faithful as Israel looked to him to defeat their enemies. It is quite fitting that these wars are called the Lord's wars. But there is something we need to grasp in this too, friends. <coughs> this side of the cross of Christ... God's people are now no longer a nation state like Israel. But we are a people, one on the cross by him, redeemed from every tribe, tongue and nation. Christ's people aren't to fight bloody wars for his kingdom. His kingdom is not of this world. Our biggest enemy is Satan. But Christ, through his death and resurrection, has ultimately struck the victory blow to our enemy, Satan. The cross has crushed Satan's head for good. Jesus made a spectacle of him at the cross. That's in Colossians chapter 2. But on this side of the final return of Jesus, we do have a battle. 
don't we? Now, enemies are not mere human forces. They're not mere flesh and blood. But we are to do battle. But we do battle with new glasses on to see our present reality. Christ, in taking our curse on the cross, has won victory over the evil one. So now, as his people, we can wrestle against the spiritual forces of evil. Not in defeat, not in fear, but with the hope of the gospel of our faithful Saviour. Next slide, please. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. My God is faithful, and I will look to him to defeat the enemy. Friends, God is faithful. Look to him to defeat our enemy. God is faithful. Look to him to defeat our enemy. Friends, there is hope for that young man from my introduction. There is hope for you and me because our hope rests on one who is faithful. Look to him. Look to him. God is faithful. Look to him in prayer. God is faithful. Look to him when you sin. God is faithful. Look to him in the wilderness. God is faithful. Look to him to defeat the enemy. God is faithful. Look to him in everything. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage today in your word so timely for us. Thank you that as we see the ups and downs of the Israelites, you give us hope, hope in your faithfulness in the midst of life's trials and in the midst of our ghastly sin. We are yours, our faithful God. We are yours because of your son cursed for us, taking our judgment, and we look to him in faith and repentance. Help us to look to you in everything, no matter how much we have sinned, no matter how wilderness-like our situation. Help us to look to you, our faithful God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.